Okay, I'm just going to jump right in here. Um, this is Romans 5. I'm sorry it's been so long since I did Romans 4. Um, but here we are. Uh, we're finally getting to start again. So um, I'm just going to start into this. I'm using the New King James because that's the easiest thing to use on my computer. And uh, so it starts with, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So obviously, Paul's just got done with what we read in Romans 4 many months ago. Um, so he's now starting into a new subject. So his therefore is to make a transition. So we've been justified by faith um, in the same way that Abraham was, and now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Abraham was justified, justified by faith. We are now justified by faith. And we begin with, because of that justifi justification by faith, we begin at peace with God. Our um, past is completely gone. Our sins are forgiven. We begin brand new in Jesus Christ. We're at peace with God. We are reconciled to him. So through Jesus Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And if you want to understand Romans or indeed the whole New Testament, this is one of the most important verses. So through Christ, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, By grace you are having been saved through faith. So we're saved by grace and through faith. Ephesians 2 8 says basically the same thing this says here. By faith, what we obtained was grace, and it's the grace itself that saves us. And so therefore, in, say, Titus 2.12, um, Paul says, Now the grace of God, which has appeared to save all men, teaches us. So it's the grace of God that's doing the saving, and we have access to that grace by faith. But what is grace? Um, you've heard it defined as unmerited favor. I think the unmerited is added to try to get something across because um, it, it, it's simply favor. You know, we are favored by God. And how did that happen? It happened because we had faith in Jesus Christ. He's reconciled us to God and he's brought us into God's favor. So through, through Jesus, we have access by faith into this favor in which we stand. We are able to stand because God, um, well, maybe an example I could give. I met a lady one time who is actually the niece of the dictator of a South American country. It's a small country um, up on the northern coast, but her uncle is a dictator and she could have been living in his favor. She could have been had free access to the um, the dictator's place of rule. I don't know if he had a palace or anything like that, but she would have had protection if anybody would have messed with her. They'd have been in really big trouble because she was the dictator's niece. We are in that kind of favor with God, and in that favor, we have so much. As a matter of fact. In the next chapter, we will read, sin does not have power over us because we're not under law, but under favor, under grace. Because God favors us, sin does not have power over us. And we have access to that favor in which we stand by faith. This is Paul's message in, in Romans. You know, you... Uh, the old covenant was under the law. You had to do things, and we couldn't do those things. But in the New Testament, by faith, we have access to this amazing power. And the reason I say amazing power is because back in chapter 1, Paul has said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God to salvation. And then he follows that because in it, 
The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He's not ashamed of the gospel. He's telling people, you're not under the law. And people are going, not under the law? How are they going to be a righteous people? How are they going to do what is good? And he goes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the power of God brings righteousness to each person who has faith. The righteousness of God is revealed in them. And, you know, a lot of times you'll go through Romans and one of the theological discussions is, is justification just right standing with God? Or is justification or justified, which can also be translated just made righteous? In, in Greek, just and righteous, justified and made righteous, same Greek word means both things. It's not two, it's two different words in English, but it's not two different words in Greek. And my answer is that John tells us in 1 John 3, 7, that do not be deceived, little children, he who practices righteousness is righteous as Christ is righteous. So yes, it's an imputed righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ. But if you're not living righteously, you don't have that imputed righteousness. And 1 John is the ultimate place to see that, where he you know, goes, if you're not uh, keeping the commands of Christ, then you don't even know God. He's... he's Probably it's, First John's like the strictest place in the New Testament, and he goes, you, "You living righteously is connected with the imputation of Christ's righteousness. God's grace is never without effect; it always causes something to happen. Um, there's power involved in being in God's favor. So uh, I hope that's clear enough." Um, my hope is that as we go through this, that when you go back and read it, you go, ah, this makes sense. Everything fits into place. Now, one thing I have been learning, we'll talk about it in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, is that we have to start here. Peace with God, favor with God, sins are forgiven. We're deli everything is in the past, it's gone. We are starting completely over. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. If you don't start there, you can't live in the favor of God because you won't believe God favors you. You're gonna go, well, look how terrible I was. Look at all the things that I did. Look at all the things that I remember. And you're gonna question the grace of God. But no, right now on the day that you've been justified by faith, and that can happen over and over again, you should be living in faith. Each day, the mercies of God are new. His, righteous, his loving kindnesses are everlasting. That's way back in the Old Testament. You can start over every single day. It says, come boldly to the throne of grace to the throne of favor, where you can find mercy and favor to help in time of need in Hebrews 4.16. So that's where we start. Access by faith into this favor before God in which we stand. That's where we stand. If you don't have that favor to stand, you're not going to have any power. You're not going to experience the pouring out of God working through you, the Holy Spirit working through you, because you're going to block it all up with guilt and everything. God has wiped your conscience free. He's cleansed it from dead works. He's made it brand new all over again. You have to start there. And that's why, you know, now Paul is going to move on to living righteously here in chapter 5. But in chapter 4, he first said, you have come into a covenant with God by faith, the same faith that Abraham had, so that God will not impute sin to you if you'll walk in the light. If you will cooperate with him, he won't impute sin to you. He's not. The only way you can get out of God's favor is by turning your back on him. Just because you are a, a terrible servant, He's going to take responsibility for empowering you not to be a terrible servant, assuming you give effort. The, it, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's Philippians 2.12. Because 
God is at work in you both to do and to will of his good pleasure. If the Holy Spirit has begun his work in you, oh, you'll want to do this. And if you'll long for doing good, if you will await the hope of righteousness which comes by faith, then you will be able to continue because of the power of God. Yes, you have to put forth effort, but we put forth effort because God is empowering us. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So, but we've got to start there. We've got to start in the good favor of God, reconciled with God, knowing that God is looking upon us favorably, loving us, in his son. We are in his son. So we are in the beloved. Um, Paul uses that phrase in Colossians 2. We have been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's beloved son. We are experiencing that love. We're in Jesus and we've been given all the favor that Jesus has. And God is not mystified by us. He's not ignorant of who we are. So you get saved, you feel so great, and the next day you do some sin, and you're like, I'm not, am I not saved? No, go back to the throne of favor, that place where you are welcome, and you will find mercy, and you will find that favor again that will help you in time of need. So that's probably enough. Let's go on to verse three. Um, and I, I might not do any more than up through verse 8, uh, but we'll try and get to this. So now Paul, oddly, just jumps right into, this is verse 3 of Romans 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. How many other things could he have started with after telling us that we have access by faith to this favor of God in which we stand? How many other things could he have started with? But he doesn't, because suffering is a really big deal. So he goes, this favor of God gives us so that we glory in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. I remember being in a Bible study once um, where they were doing James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and I'd only been a Christian maybe two years, even less, and uh, so I wasn't quick to make any comments there, but I listened to them for about 20 minutes talking about how backwards the kingdom of God is, how upside down from the world's ways. And finally, I couldn't take it. And I was like, I don't think James 1, 2 through 4 is upside down from the world's ways. I think that if we are focused on, in James 1, uh, 2 through 4, says basically what this says. It says we count it all joy, when, or it commands us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials because the trying of our faith work is, works patience in us. And when we let patience have its perfect work, we'll be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So I told them, if what we want is to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, then we want the things that will make us perfect and complete, lacking nothing, and suffering is one of those things. So an Olympic athlete trying to win a gold medal in the Olympics is willing to go through incredible suffering, to go, I'm going to bear suffering more than anybody else so that I can be the one who receives that that gold medal, that temporary medal that will eventually become corrupt. Whereas we're after a permanent crown that we will wear for all eternity. How much more should we be the ones go? I'm going to suffer more than anybody else so that I can obtain a perfect and complete character and be pleasing to Jesus on that last day. So Paul launches right into that because this is one of our major routes to becoming what we're supposed to be. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the Holy Spirit has been poured out inside of us. Our hope is, um, is eternal. Uh, sorry, I'm sitting on an exercise ball. Um, but our hope is eternal. You know, we've, we've, 
he the the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1:13 is called a down payment for what we're gonna receive one day when we go into the king, eternal kingdom of heaven, and there living with Christ, we're going to have even more than what the Holy Spirit has, has given us now. So we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. So I want to just say one more thing about this sufferings things and trials. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas go back to churches that they have preached to before, and they appoint elders in all the churches. And I'm sure when they did that, there was a lot of talk and a lot of explaining. Here's what the elder's going to do. Here's this. Here's that. And, you know, here's what I want you to learn because I only had a few days with you the last time. But the only thing recorded in Acts chapter 14 that they said to the churches, even though surely they said so much more, but Luke chooses to record one thing. They strengthened the churches and they said to them, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of heaven. This is central. Our, our, our trials and tribulations are not taking away. Suffering is a major part of us going into the, into the next age. And so in chapter eight of Romans, we're gonna read that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Our tribulations are they're the refining fire for us to make us what we're supposed to be, right? We want to arrive at the throne of God, blameless and without fault. And that's going to happen partly by trial. It's going to happen partly because God does not impute to us sin while we're walking with him, you know? Every day, John says it differently. First John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin. We have to walk in the light. We want to confess our sins. We want to keep our hearts completely open before God. He is not shocked by our weakness. He knows about it. He's rescuing us. As a matter of fact, a little further down, it says God demonstrates, this is verse eight of chapter five, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, God knew that we were sinners. He knew that this was going to be a process. He knew that we were going to have to suffer. He knew that we were going to sin. And he wants us to make every effort not to. And in 2 Peter 1, 9, it says, or maybe it's 10. I think it's 10. Make every effort to do these things. Um, so, but it's all about growing. 2 Peter 1, 8 says, if these things are in you and increasing, they make you so that you shall never be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a, this is a, a marathon. It's not a sprint. It is a race. We want to run the race with joy, but at the, it is a marathon and there's going to be suffering. Okay. And that suffering is going to help make us what we are supposed to be on the last day. So I've used up almost 20 minutes, basically on the first five verses of Romans 5. But I, I don't know if this, vi vi if this video encouraged you, but it delighted me. I am excited. I am ready to go in today. I'm ready to face the trials that come my way. I'm ready to trust in Christ. I'm ready to live by the power of the Holy Spirit that's been shed abroad in my heart. And I want to encourage you to be the same way. Thank you so much for joining me for this. And uh, at least me a couple more videos, I guess, to get through Romans 5. So thank you so much. Bye-bye.